Recently, I read a newspaper item that said there are too many counties in most states. The article pointed out that most county boundaries were established decades before the first automobile was built, and while the horse and buggy was the chief mode of travel. But today, with fast automobiles and good roads, there is no reason why three or four counties could not be combined. This would cut down greatly on duplicated services so that taxpayers would actually get better service for less money. The writer of this article said he thought he had stumbled across a really live idea, so he interviewed 30 people at random to get their reactions. The result? Not one person thought the idea had merit, even though it would provide them with better local government at less cost. That's an example of traditional thinking. The traditional thinker's mind is paralyzed. He reasons, it's been this way for a hundred years, therefore it must be good and must stay this way. Why risk a change? Average people have always resented progress. Many voiced a protest toward the automobile on the grounds that nature meant for us to walk or use horses. The airplane seemed drastic to many. Man had no right to enter the province reserved for birds. A lot of status quoers still insist that man has no business in space. One top missile expert recently gave an answer to this kind of thinking. Man belongs, says Dr. Von Braun, where man wants to go. Around 1900, a sales executive discovered a scientific principle of sales management. It received a lot of publicity and even found its way into textbooks. The principle was this. There is one best way to sell a product. Find the best way, then never deviate from it. Fortunately for this man's company, new leadership came in in time to save the organization from financial ruin. Contrast that experience with the philosophy of Crawford H. Greenwald, president of one of the nation's largest business organizations, E.I. DuPont de Nemours. In a talk at Columbia University, Mr. Greenwald said, There are many ways in which a good job can be done as many ways, in fact, as there are men to whom the task is given. In truth, there is no one best way to do anything. There is no one best way to decorate an apartment, landscape a lawn, make a sale, rear a child, or cook a steak. There are as many best ways as there are creative minds. Nothing grows in ice. If we let tradition freeze our minds, new ideas can't sprout. Make this test sometime soon. Propose one of these ideas to someone and then watch his behavior. One, the postal system, long a government monopoly, should be turned over to private enterprise. Two, presidential elections should be held every two or six years instead of four. Three, regular hours for retail stores should be 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. instead of 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Four, the retirement age should be raised to 70. Whether these ideas are sound or practical is not the point. What is significant is how a person handles propositions like these. If he laughs at the idea and doesn't give it a second thought, and probably 95% will laugh at it, chances are he suffers from tradition paralysis. But the one in 20 who says, that's an interesting idea, tell me more about it, has a mind that's turned to creativity. Traditional thinking is personal enemy number one for the person who is interested in a creative personal success program. Traditional thinking freezes your mind, blocks your progress, and prevents you from developing creative power. Here are three ways to fight it. 1. Become receptive to ideas. Welcome new ideas. Destroy these thought repellents. Won't work. Can't be done. It's useless. And it's stupid. A very successful friend of mine who holds a major position with an insurance company said to me, I don't pretend to be the smartest guy in the business, but I think I am the best sponge in the insurance industry. I make it a point to soak up all the good ideas I can. 2. Be an experimental person. Break up fixed routines. Expose yourself to new restaurants, new books, new theaters, new friends. Take a different route to work someday. Take a different vacation this year. Do something new and different this weekend. If your work is in distribution, develop an interest in production, accounting, finance, and the other elements of business. This gives you breadth and prepares you for larger responsibilities. 
Three, be progressive, not regressive. Not, that's the way we did it where I used to work, so we ought to do it that way here. But, how can we do it better than we did it where I used to work? Not backward, regressive thinking, but forward, progressive thinking. Because you got up at 5.30 a.m. to deliver papers or milk the cows when you were a youngster, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea for you to require your children to do the same. Imagine what would happen to the Ford Motor Company if its management allowed itself to think, this year we've built the ultimate in automobiles. Further improvement is impossible. Therefore, all experimental engineering and designing activities are hereby permanently terminated. Even the mammoth Ford Motor Company would shrivel fast with this attitude. Successful people, like successful businesses, live with these questions. How can I improve the quality of my performance? How can I do better? Absolute perfection in all human undertakings, from building missiles to rearing children, is unattainable. This means there is endless room for improvement. Successful people know this, and they are always searching for a better way. Note, the successful person doesn't ask, can I do it better? He knows he can. So he phrases the question, how can I do it better? A few months ago, a former student of mine, in business for just four years, opened her fourth hardware store. This was quite a feat, considering the young lady's small initial capital investment of only $3,500, strong competition from other stores, and the relatively short time she had been in business. I visited her new store shortly after it opened to congratulate her on the fine progress she had made. In an indirect way, I asked her how she was able to make a success of three stores and open a fourth one, when most merchants had to struggle to make a success of just one store. Naturally, she answered, I worked hard, but just getting up early and working late isn't responsible for the four stores. Most people in my business work hard. The main thing I attribute my success to is my self-styled weekly improvement program. A weekly improvement program? Sounds impressive. How does it work? I asked. Well, it really isn't anything elaborate, she continued. It's just a plan to help me do a better job as each week rolls around. To keep my forward thinking on the track, I've divided my job into four elements. Customers, employees, merchandise, and promotion. All during the week, I make notes and jot down ideas as to how I can improve my business. Then, every Monday evening, I set aside four hours to review the ideas I've jotted down and figure out how to put the solid ones to use in the business. In this four-hour period, I force myself to take a hard look at my operation. I don't simply wish more customers would shop in my store. Instead, I ask myself, what can I do to attract more customers? How can I develop regular, loyal customers? She went on describing numerous little innovations that made her first three stores so successful. Things like the way she arranged the merchandise within her stores, her suggestion selling technique that sold two out of three customers merchandise they had not planned to buy when they entered her stores, the credit plan she devised when many of her customers were out of work because of a strike, the contest she developed that boosted sales during a slack season. I ask myself, what can I do to improve my merchandise offerings? And I get ideas. Let me cite just one case. Four weeks ago, it occurred to me that I should do something to get more youngsters into the store. I reasoned if I had something here to draw the kids to the store, I'd also draw more of the parents. I kept thinking about it, and then this idea came. Put in a line of small carted toys for children in the four to eight age bracket. It's working. The toys take little space, and I make a nice profit on them. But most important, the toys have increased store traffic. Believe me, she went on, my weekly improvement plan works. Just by conscientiously asking myself, how can I do a better job, I find the answers. It's a rare Monday night that I don't come up with some plan or technique that makes that profit and loss statement look better. And I've learned something else, too, about successful merchandising. Something that I think every person going into business for himself should know. What's that, I asked. Just this. It isn't so much what you know when you start that matters. It's what you learn and put to use after you open your doors that counts most. Big success 
calls for persons who continually set higher standards for themselves and others. Persons who are searching for ways to increase efficiency, to get more output at lower cost, do more with less effort. Top success is reserved for the I can do it better kind of person. General Electric uses the slogan, progress is our most important product. Why not make progress your most important product? The I can do better philosophy works magic. When you ask yourself, how can I do better? Your creative power is switched on and ways for doing things better suggest themselves. Here is a daily exercise that will help you discover and develop the power of the I can do better attitude. Each day before you begin work, devote 10 minutes to thinking, how can I do a better job today? Ask, what can I do today to encourage my employees? What special favor can I do for my customers? How can I increase my personal efficiency? This exercise is simple, but it works. Try it and you'll find unlimited creative ways to win greater success.